In the nearly 40 years since his death, people still love Yul Brynner for his role as King Mong Kut in the famous stage musical The King and I. However, the audience's view of Yul Brynner completely changed after surprising revelations from his daughter. His unpleasant, petty, and unkind nature made Yul Brynner silently become the most hated person in his life and career. Today, we will reveal what Yul Brynner's daughter has kept hidden for nearly four decades. Don't miss it. Yul Brynner, the iconic actor renowned for his mesmerizing performances, was not only celebrated for his talent but also infamous for his impossibly demanding and merciless nature. His portrayal of King Monkut of Siam in the 1956 film adaptation of The King and I earned him an Oscar for Best Actor. However, this film remains banned in Thailand due to its unflattering depiction of the monarch, a characterization that some might argue mirrored Brenner's own persona. Brenner's commitment to the role of King Mongkut was unparalleled, having performed it an astounding 4,125 times on stage. He once admitted, The King Takes Me Over, suggesting a deep immersion into the character that may have spilled over into his personal life. Despite the success of this role, Brenner's filmography includes other celebrated works, such as The Ten Commandments, The Magnificent Seven, and Westworld. However, tales of Brenner's egotism and demanding behavior were as legendary as his performances. Bitter rivalries with fellow actors, including Steve McQueen and Ingrid Bergman, marked his career. Bergman, who won the Best Actress Oscar the same year Brenner won the shared stories of his churlish behavior on the set of Anastasia. Brenner's insecurity about his height led to a contentious encounter with the taller Bergman, who suggested using a prop to conceal their height difference. In response, Brenner's retort, I am not going to play this on a box. I'm going to show the world what a big horse you are, revealed his prickly nature. Paranoia oversize extended to Brenner's conflicts with Steve McQueen during The Magnificent Seven. Brenner, desperate to appear taller, reportedly stood on a small mound of earth during scenes with McQueen. In a retaliatory move, McQueen would discreetly kick over the dirt whenever possible, subtly challenging Brenner's attempt at dominance. McQueen further sought to upstage Brenner by engaging in distracting actions, such as playing with his gun or fidgeting with his cowboy hat while Brenner delivered lines. Yule Brenner's tumultuous relationship with Steve McQueen on the set of The Magnificent Seven extended beyond on-screen dynamics. According to co-star Eli Wallach's autobiography, Brenner went to the extreme of hiring an assistant whose sole task was to count the number of times McQueen touched his hat while Brenner was delivering lines. This meticulous monitoring highlighted the intensity of the rivalry between the two actors. In McQueen's own admission, we didn't get along. Brenner's confrontational behavior escalated when he approached McQueen in front of a crowd, grabbing him by the shoulder and reflecting his simmering anger. McQueen speculated that Brenner's discomfort might have stemmed from his lack of proficiency in horse riding and firearms. Perceiving McQueen, who was at ease in these elements, as a potential threat. McQueen, known for his assertiveness, asserted, I was in my element. He wasn't. When you work in a scene with Yule, you're supposed to stand perfectly still, ten feet away. Well, I don't work that way, so I protected myself. Brenner's enigmatic persona extended beyond his onset conflicts. He cultivated an air of mystery surrounding his origins, perpetuating various stories about his early life. In line with his penchant for drama, he humorously claimed, There are ten or twelve stories in circulation about my early life, including his father's alleged Mongol heritage. Adding to the confusion, Brenner provided conflicting information about his birth year, citing 1915, 1917, 1920, and 1922 at different times. In a display of imperiousness, he declared, Ordinary mortals need but one birthday. The truth of Brenner's origins eventually emerged, dispelling the myths he wove. Born Yuli Borisovich Briner in Vladivostok on July 11, 1920, as confirmed on his tombstone, he couldn't escape the habit of spinning tales. 
Among his fantastical claims was the assertion of having fought for the International Brigade during the Spanish Civil War, adding another layer of intrigue to the complex and enigmatic personality of Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner's early life was marked by turmoil and adventure. Following the abandonment of his family by his father, Boris, a mining engineer, Brynner spent his formative years in Beijing. His daughter Victoria revealed that Yule harbored bitterness towards his father. In 1932, amidst the escalating conflict between China and Japan, Brynner's mother, Maruzia, made a daring move to relocate the family to Paris, laying the foundation for Yule's life of diverse experiences. After leaving school at the young age of 16, Brynner embarked on a journey that showcased his versatility and flair for the dramatic. He initially joined a traveling gypsy troupe, where he played the guitar. Later, he transitioned into the world of acrobatics as a trapeze artist with the renowned Cirque de Verre. However, his circus career came to an abrupt halt in 1937 when he fell from the parallel bars, suffering a staggering 49 fractures. As he recuperated from his injuries, the multilingual Brinner, fluent in English, French, Japanese, Hungarian, and some Russian, shifted his focus to the stage. This ambition prompted his move to America in 1940, marking the beginning of a decade-long period of struggle and perseverance. During this time, Brenner took on various roles, from driving a bus for an actor's company to playing small roles on Broadway. Additionally, he worked as a French-speaking radio announcer for the U.S. Office of War. Amidst his burgeoning career, Brenner's personal life added another layer of complexity. He had a passionate affair with actor Herd Hatfield, best known for his portrayal of the title role in The Picture of Dorian Gray, 1945. Notably, Brynner posed for naked full-frontal portraits for the renowned gay photographer George Platt Linus during this period. Although Brynner later had four marriages and numerous high-profile affairs with actresses like Marlene Dietrich, Judy Garland, and Joan Crawford, he never publicly acknowledged his bisexuality. His male relationships, including one purportedly with poet and filmmaker Jean Cocteau, were discreetly kept out of the public eye, contributing to the carefully curated image of Brynner as a happily married man to actress Virginia Gilmore in the press. Yul Brynner's journey to becoming the iconic King Mongkut of Siam in The King and I was a tale of initial adversity and eventual triumph. When he initially auditioned for the role in 1950, the production was primarily centered around Gertrude Lawrence, who played Anna, the English governess, to Moncut's children. The audience's reaction to Brynner was initially negative, with one disgruntled spectator even going so far as to throw a shoe at him during a performance. Brynner, with characteristic humor, remarked on the incident, noting, And it was a perfectly serviceable shoe. The man must have really hated me. Despite the rocky start, Brynner's performances proved to be so captivating that audiences soon flocked to see him. Proud of his long locks, Brynner decided to shave his head to fully embody the image of a Siamese monarch. This bold move not only added authenticity to his portrayal, but also generated significant publicity. Brynner, with his piercing gaze, arched eyebrows, and now signature bald head, became a globally recognized figure after the release of the movie version of The King and I. In March 1952, Brenner won a Tony Award for Best Featured Actor in a Musical, further solidifying his standing in the theatrical world. However, he harbored resentment about not being listed as the main star of The King and I. The turning point came in August 1952, when Gertrude Lawrence fainted backstage after a Saturday matinee performance and passed away within weeks. According to Ken Bloom's Show Him Tell, the new book of Broadway anecdotes, Brynner's reaction was not one of grief, but of realization that he would now receive top billing. With Lawrence's untimely death, Brynner's already oversized ego seemed to expand further. The film version of The King and I propelled him to international fame, and his distinctive look became synonymous with the character. 
Charlton Heston praised Brenner's work, stating, Yule's work in The King and I was beyond compare. However, Brenner's newfound fame came with its own set of quirks. Notably, he insisted on not being photographed next to any other hairless actors, reportedly instructing his press agent with a decree of no pictures with Baldy. This idiosyncratic demand highlighted Brenner's commanding presence, both on and off the stage, and added yet another layer to the complex persona of this mesmerizing actor. At the pinnacle of his fame during the run of The King and I, Yul Brynner's behavior offstage became increasingly notorious. Frank Langella, who was starring as Dracula at the Martin Beck Theater at the same time The King and I played at the St. James Theater, provided a candid account of Brynner's demeanor in his 2012 memoir, Dropped Names, Famous Men and Women as I Knew Them. Langella painted a portrait of Brenner as a man consumed by narcissism. He described Brenner as being perpetually close to a full-length mirror, with the word I, I, featuring prominently in his conversations. Langella's most disturbing revelation concerned Brenner's racial prejudice. During a ride in Brenner's 20-foot-long white limousine, the actor demonstrated gadgets in the car, including strobe lights. In a shocking display, Brenner aimed the lights at Langella and his wife, claiming, This is in case blacks attack my car. I shine these at them and click many times. They think they are being photographed and run away. This revelation highlighted Brenner's disturbing racial biases. Langella further disclosed Brenner's demand for special treatment, stating that the actor had instructed the theater to build a special lift to accommodate his car, allowing him to avoid interacting with the public. Brenner often expressed disdain for his audiences, once telling Langella that they were shti and that he refused to bow, presenting his backside instead. When Brenner returned to playing Mong Cut in the 1980s, he bragged about humiliating noisy theater-goers, declaring, The theater is my palace, and I can tell them what to do. By this time, Brenner's reputation as a tyrant had spread throughout the theatrical world. Numerous stories circulated about his vicious remarks to production staff and threats to have people sacked. Despite, or perhaps because of, his demanding nature, Brenner took pride in his ruthless approach to the theater. He told television host Bill Boggs, I am merciless about things in the theater. The lazy louts should be afraid of me. Any dead wood that I come across, I simply break it off. Despite his notorious temper, Brenner adamantly claimed that he had no need for psychotherapy, asserting, The day anyone stretches me out on a couch, I'll be either drunk or dead. This declaration encapsulated the unyielding and often erratic nature of Yul Brenner's persona during this, tumultuous period in his career. His son, Yul Brenner Jr., known by the childhood nickname Rocky, openly acknowledged his father's challenging nature, noting that Yul Brenner could be difficult and went a little crazy at times. Rocky, who later carved his own unique path working as the road manager for the band and Bob Dylan and serving as a bodyguard to Muhammad Ali, hinted at the complexities of growing up with the renowned actor. Ray Harryhausen, the special effects maestro who worked on The Magnificent Seven, described Brenner as a good actor, but also as a man who was difficult and bad-tempered with his own set of demands. This sentiment was echoed by Brenner's agent, Robbie Lance, who revealed that the actor's contract demands were astonishingly meticulous. Brenner would specify details, such as the color of the carpet in his trailer, the type of tissues provided, and even the brand of bottled water. In hotel suites, his imperial conditions included touch-tone telephones with 13-foot cords, blackout curtains for better sleep, a preference for brown eggs at breakfast, and an insistence on extremely expensive bottles of wine. By the time Brenner took on the role of Captain Muller in the 1965 film Morituri, starring alongside Marlon Brando as the captain, he had reached a level of influence where he could make extraordinary stipulations. Brenner, powerful enough to assert his preferences, insisted that a landing pad be constructed on the ship, enabling a private helicopter to take him ashore after each day's shoot. 
This extravagant demand underscored both the actor's commanding presence in the industry and his penchant for personalized and opulent arrangements. Despite earning what his agent Robbie Lance described as astronomical fees, Yul Brynner garnered a reputation for being surprisingly frugal. This facet of his personality became evident through anecdotes from those who worked closely with him, shedding light on Brynner's penchant for penny-pinching. One such account comes from George Jacobs, a member of Frank Sinatra's staff. Jacobs, who became acquainted with Brynner through their shared involvement in the 1966 thriller Cast a Giant Shadow and their mutual interest in golf, revealed in his memoir, Mr. S., the last word on Frank Sinatra, that Brynner would often hang around Sinatra, relying on him for food, drinks, and socializing. Jacobs and his associates humorously dubbed Brynner Uncle Scrooge and the King of the Tightwads, underlining Brynner's reputation for being economical despite his considerable wealth. Brynner's interests extended beyond acting, as he was also an accomplished photographer. He captured over 8,000 photographs, some of which gained acclaim, showcasing the likes of Elizabeth Taylor, Anthony Quinn, Sophia Loren, Mia Farrow, and Audrey Hepburn. Notably, Hepburn served as the godmother to Brynner's daughter, Victoria, born to his second wife, the Chilean model Doris Kleiner. In 1996, Victoria compiled a collection of her father's photographic works for the coffee table book, Yul Brynner Photographer. This publication provided a glimpse into Brynner's artistic pursuits and his ability to capture the essence of his famous peers through his lens. Expanding his ventures, Brynner capitalized on his fame by venturing into the culinary world. He authored the Yul Brynner Cookbook, Food Fit for the King and You, sharing his personal recipes, including intriguing dishes like dandelion soup and pork and sauerkraut ragu. This cookbook represented another facet of Brynner's multifaceted personality, demonstrating his willingness to explore and share aspects of his life beyond the realm of acting. In 1971, Yul Brynner embarked on his third marriage, tying the knot with Jacqueline Thion de la Chaume, the fashion editor of French Vogue. This union marked a period of personal and familial expansion for Brynner. Alongside Jacqueline, he adopted two Vietnamese children, Mia and Melody, extending his family and venturing into parenthood once again. The couple also made a significant real estate investment purchasing the 16th-century 50-acre Manoir de Cricbeuf in Normandy, where Brenner indulged in an unusual passion, maintaining a rookery of penguins on the estate. Despite his fame as an actor, Brenner was not confined to the world of entertainment. An avid reader with a diverse intellectual background, he studied philosophy at the Sorbonne and attended ethics classes in Chicago, under the guidance of Dr. Paul Arthur Shilp, a highly respected scholar who founded the Library of Living Philosophers. Shilp, describing Brenner, stated that he possessed one of the most brilliant minds I ever encountered and commended him for being well-versed in politics, economics, literature, music, and history. During this time, Brenner remained actively engaged in humanitarian efforts. He took pride in his involvement with the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, contributing to campaigns aimed at combating prejudice against the Roma people, commonly known as gypsies. As his personal life evolved, Brynner continued to immerse himself in intellectually stimulating pursuits. When he received the script for Westworld, a science fiction thriller by Michael Crichton, he found the thematic exploration of human infantilism in the face of new technology particularly compelling. Brynner, who appreciated the depth of the script, praised the film for delving into this thought-provoking theme. Crichton, recognizing Brynner's fit for the role of the cyborg gunslinger in the movie, remarked, If anyone really built a place like Westworld, they probably would make the gunfighter robot in the image of Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner approached his role in Westworld with a level of dedication that mirrored his commitment to previous projects. 
In his portrayal of the malfunctioning robot with a steely stare, Brenner went to great lengths for authenticity, even wearing silver metallic contact lenses throughout filming. This attention to detail added a robotic intensity to his performance, showcasing his commitment to bringing depth to his characters. Richard Benjamin, who played the target of Brenner's malfunctioning robot in the futuristic amusement park, fondly remembered their time working together. Benjamin praised Brenner, stating, Yul Brenner was just the best, and credited him with teaching valuable lessons, including how to fire a gun in a movie without blinking. Brenner, with his extensive experience, imparted his wisdom to Benjamin, noting that even the biggest Western stars tended to blink when the gun went off. Benjamin described Brenner as a pretty amazing, larger-than-life person, highlighting the impact the veteran actor had on his co-stars. Westworld proved to be Brenner's last significant movie role, marking the end of an era in his cinematic career. His final appearance on the big screen came in the Italian Western Death Rage in 1976. Despite his remarkable contributions to film, Brenner expressed regret over one unfulfilled dream, making a film about Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey. However, the ambitious project faced insurmountable challenges, including disagreements about the facts of Ataturk's life. In the aftermath of his illustrious film career, Brenner found himself returning to the role that had defined much of his stage success, Moncout in The King and I. Endless tours and Broadway reruns became a recurring part of his later years. Mary Beth Peel, Brenner's leading lady for the final two years of the touring production, shared a surprising encounter that defied the warnings she received before meeting him. Contrary to expectations, Brenner greeted her with a warm hug and the words, Welcome to the family, showcasing a more personal and unexpected side to the iconic actor in his later years. Yul Brenner's life took a somber turn when, at the age of 12, he started smoking, eventually becoming a heavy smoker with a consumption of five packs a day. The repercussions of this habit caught up with him in 1983, the same year he entered his fourth marriage with Kathy Lee, a 24-year-old Malaysian chorus line dancer. Brenner received the devastating diagnosis of throat cancer. Faced with the gravity of his condition, Brenner turned to Buddhism, finding solace and understanding in the face of his imminent mortality. He reflected on the gypsy saying that, your future is getting shorter, embracing this newfound awareness. At the age of 65, on October 10, 1985, Yul Brenner succumbed to his battle with cancer. Remarkably, Shortly before his death, he completed a triumphant return to Broadway, showcasing his enduring commitment to his craft. One poignant testament to his legacy was a posthumous commercial Brenner recorded for the American Cancer Society, which aired after his passing. In this message from beyond the grave, Brenner emphatically warned against smoking, stating, Now that I'm gone, I tell you, don't smoke whatever you do. Just don't smoke. This heartfelt plea proved impactful, credited with inspiring thousands of individuals to quit smoking. In typical Brenner fashion, known for his enigmatic personality, he provided various versions specifying what should be written on his headstone. Among the proposed epitaphs were, I have arrived, and here lies a man who adored children of all varieties. However, in an ironic twist, one of his contract demands that went unfulfilled was the epitaph on his headstone. Today, his remains rest in a Loire churchyard in France, with the only words on the headstone being his name and the dates of his birth and death, underscoring the enigma that Yul Brynner maintained even in his final moments. What do you think about Yul Brynner's extremely special life and personality? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.